Yeah, when I tell you what they do, it you're gonna go, oh, is that all? Um, it's a, <laughs> prepare yourselves. It's a way for insurance companies to text with their customers. Oh, oh but <laughs> yeah. uh, Greg, should we just finish off? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yes. Mike, <laughs> Mike, drop. Right. Um, no, I'm, no, I'm biased, but I loved it. Best job I ever have. Greatest people I got to work with. I, m I miss them every day. It's an yeah. amazing place to be. Wow. Yeah, that's cool, man. That's good. I, I, I like that, but like, I like it when people have gone from corporates and then moved to their own thing and they say they miss it. You know what I mean? I, I'm yeah. the same as you. Like, yeah, there's something cool about working for companies sometimes, you know? Yeah, it all depends on the company, right? Yeah. I certainly have some that I don't miss so much, but I appreciate <laughs> the learning. Tell me about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. <laughs>
I just took mayonnaise. That was no it. <laughs> yeah, cut out the middleman. I just went straight like mayonnaise is a good part of it because you can make them fast and eat them before. Like I was, someone described me as a food ninja because I could like, I'd be in and out. You wouldn't even know where I came from and the food was just gone. Um, <laughs> yeah. And like the plus side is I learned to be a morning person because I would wake up really early to eat whatever wow. junk food was around before anyone could be there to stop me. Um, wow. To this day, I'm a morning person. I just use it to work out before other people wake out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like, you know, you said like I was seeking happiness. Um, I, I was trying to. And the thing about food is like, yeah, in that moment, I mean, we all feel like you have something warm and delicious and you're like, oh, it feels so good. But then you don't. Mm -hmm. um, either because you're full and uncomfortable um, or because the food stopped pleasing you because you're done with it. And then what? And so you're just back to that hole. And so I kept eating uh, for an emotional hunger, not for a physical hunger. And so I was constantly hungry. And so I'd constantly eat more. And uh, that's, you know, that's not a recipe for health at all. So that smiley little boy who was like skinny and that vanished really quickly. And you look at a picture of me at like age six and I was already really pudgy to say it nicely. Um, and I was not happy. Like I wasn't smiling. And that defined the rest of my childhood into my teens. I was... Uh, it to be about a hundred pounds overweight. And, um, wow. I was just a constantly like, you know, what, what's going wrong? Like what, what's going to hit me? And, um, yeah, it's not, it's not really the right way to grow up as a child. Mm -mm. Um, yeah. yeah. Not at all. And you know, physiologically as well, it's like a protection thing, isn't it? Like you're in a stress response. It's a big stressful time. It's just almost like it's almost just a natural thing to do is to your yeah. body goes into like you know uh, uh, you know protection mode and you just start eating to for the time that your body doesn't realize that maybe there's danger ahead you know and so you just you just eat and eat and um, I'm sure it's it's quite common and it's it's really sad that parents don't always realize what an impact it can have on on youngsters and so you said yeah. it was with me did, did that sort of you know I, I presume you know when it's a messy one it's not just that few days it can like could have sort of drag on a little bit yeah did, it was did that sort of happen with you guys yeah um it's really interesting my parents are like good friends now like we all have holiday meals together which is really nice and also a little bit strange we're like like they're the four of them like my parents and my two step parents are at the end of the table they're all like talking amongst mm -hmm. themselves and all the kids are talking you know kids and grandkids like at the other end and it's kind of like this is weird Cause like they would have had like, you know, 12 people in between them and like, you know, sitting like this so they couldn't see. And now like we almost don't have to be in the room. Like they're content. To, I'm waiting for them to all just go out for dinner together and not. Anyway. Um, so yeah, things, things have changed dramatically. I mean, to be fair, like my mother's with uh, a different guy than uh, my, my current stepfather is not the stepfather I had immediately after my parents split up. So like, you know, I can understand why my dad's more comfortable with the new one than he was with the old one. You know, there, there's a lot to it, but um, yeah, it was, uh, it's funny. I always say like the way my mother pronounced your father as a phrase, it was Ooh, like, uh. a swear. it was like your father. Yeah. And like my dad actually is a really good guy. Like he didn't do anything. And uh, yeah. so I, I was sort of being trained to feel negatively towards him. And of course, he had all this anger and bitterness that he didn't vocalize, but he kept it inside as this like quiet anger. And you could feel that. And so it was whichever, whichever parent I was with, you know, like weekends with my dad, or at first we did a week with one or the other. Um, it just was not, it wasn't a good feeling. It was like a constant feeling of fighting. And, uh, you know, add to that, I wasn't just medicating around the anxiety of the divorce with food. Then I was medicating the results of being obese. Because mm -hmm. now I'm being told, like, you know, my dad's a doctor, so he's, like, giving me this hard time. And he used to be uh, the fat kid as well. We looked almost exactly the same. He just had glasses. Like, our childhood mm -hmm. pictures were really similar. Wow. Um, so he's got this, like, you know, this personal feeling of what he went through added to knowing medically why this isn't good. And so he's really tough with me about it. And I feel disgusting. And then you get into middle school and high school, and kids are starting to date. Mm -hmm. And no one's going to date me. So then mm. you add all that, you know, like I become really aware of my appearance. Um, mm. So it just, all of it. I mean, I, I don't, I don't have a lot of blatantly happy moments as a little kid where I'm like, yeah, I was just kind of purely happy where I definitely do now. It's not to say I don't have stress, but like mm. I can point to a number of times where there was not a care in my mind and I was just really content all around. And I have not a single memory of that probably until I was, I don't know, 
I was going to say like 19 or something like that, but maybe not even until I was in my late thirties. Wow. Mid late thirties. Yeah. Like I needed wow. to wake up. I, I had to go through some things, which is why I'm here. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, totally. Did, did you ever like, um, speak to your folks about it? Did you like say, you know, what, why did you treat me like that? Like, you know, like manipulate me, I guess. Did you ever have that yeah. it's, courage to ask them or? It's not, uh, it's not that simple. Um, cause of course, and, and maybe I'm not trying to like sound egotistical, but good for me for recognizing this. Like my mother wasn't, she, I had nothing to do with her behaving that way about my dad. Mm-hmm. I had nothing to do with my father's anger or what, like, at least I, I had enough understanding to know, like, uh, she's not doing that to me consciously. It doesn't mm-hmm. make it okay, but also recognize that's coming from her own issues and, and his, you know, he, he can be a, 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 a bitter might be the slightly wrong way to say it, but sort of like holding this anger about what someone did. Um, he's a very values driven person, which I am as well. And I have a ton of respect for that. Like my dad and I actually have really similar views on, you know, honesty and infidelity and, uh, you know, like a, a husband of a, a girlfriend of my mother's uh, cheated him and a bunch of the other husbands out of money like years ago. The guy ended up going to jail years later, but like to this day, my father, like the money's irrelevant now, but he's like, oh, that guy, like he still holds it. And it's, I don't know, like 40 years ago. Wow. So like, you know, I feel for him for holding that kind of anger, but I also understand where it's coming from. It has nothing to do, like, I'm not the reason why he was in that mood. Uh, it doesn't make it easy to be around, but um, I, you know, I, I, it's funny. I had an understanding for their emotional state, hmm. probably more so than my own, uh, hmm. which, which I think we're all, it's like, I always say like, you can catch your own type. You can catch someone else's typos when they like send you an email, but you can't yeah. catch your own. <laughs> totally. But I think it's a bit of that. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess also, you know, like you, they, they obviously they're human beings, so they have their own thing, as you said, and they, to some degree, they're projecting the whole time, this emotion. So you can yeah. clearly read and you were the youngest as if I'm understanding correctly. So you yeah. kind of have that, you know, you have that view of things as slightly different and myself being the youngest as well. I know exactly what you mean. A very similar sort of time frame uh, yeah. with overweights and all that you, you get to see a lot and not actually understand your own emotions, hence eating and stuff. I guess it's something you can have some kind of control over. So it's really fascinating how these things work. eh? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really fair. And, and um, maybe it was a bit of being the youngest that I was the one who was always around like the older kids, you know, they went off and they, they or their friends had cars. So like they were sort of out of the picture and I was the one stuck there. So you, you get into this servant kind of role, not like they're making me do chores for them or, you know, feed them grapes or whatever. Like, (laughs) I, you're like, it's just presumed you'll be there. And it's just presumed like you'll do these things with them or whatever. Um, and it's not that I minded, but I, I did recognize like, you know, my friends would all be going to a party and um, I wouldn't be able to because that was my weekend with my dad. And so I wouldn't have plans with friends and it never occurred to me to do that. And my sister would be like, I'm out of here. I remember mm-hmm. my father, like he was driving and he pulled over and he's like, son, you need to have friends. And I was like, I have friends. I'm not seeing them because I'm supposed to be spending time with you. Like it, it was like, I don't know, kind of smacked me in the face. It's like, dude, like you're the reason I'm not seeing anybody. It's not because yeah. I don't have friends. Oh. But yeah, oh. I, did, I did feel this sort of respo- responsibility for my parents is a theme. Totally. It comes up a lot. And that's, that's not really on them. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like maybe there are things they did from time to time that led to my reaction, but they didn't make me do that. that was, that's who I am. Uh, and that's a theme throughout my life. And that's a big part of my anxiety is this sense that, I mean, it goes right back to being five years old, like everything's falling apart and there's nothing I can do about it. And as soon as I was old enough or capable enough in any given situation to be able to do something about it, I took the, like, get out of my way. I'm doing something about it, mm-hmm. uh, which has served me really well and served me horribly at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so have you had a mayonnaise sandwich since? No, no, <laughs> no. and I'm vegan now, so I won't. I won't touch uh, that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so talking about you know you're still a youngster. I think you were in fifth grade. You you were ten years old, and you got teased by a counselor. I'm not sure if it was a camp counselor or yeah, a summer person. camp counselor. Who I weighed the same. I was either ten or eleven. I don't know. We were both like 172. Um, yeah. So when when people say like you know I want to get back to my high school weight, like if I was at my high school weight, I 
would be, you know, on some sort of cholesterol medication or something like that, <laughs> or talking about a uh, gastric bypass. Yeah. I weigh the same as I did kind of like May of my fifth grade year in uh, elementary school. Wow. wow. No, yeah. about, now you weigh that much. Yeah. 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 Wow, man. Always. That's crazy, bud. Yeah. Yeah, so so I weigh more than that counselor now. So yeah. <laughs> I can also but, probably but, take him now. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but like that must be like really tough to take as a kid. You know what I mean? When someone, points that out to you at that age you know yeah i was generally referred to by my weight i remember um you know we were uh we were going skiing and getting the equipment to and they have to they have to know your weight to adjust the binding so it knows when to release and the guy doing it was like where's the 108 pounder and i think i was like in fourth grade or so i don't know um that like that's even though our names were on everything and my brother was jason like you know everyone was by their name and then there was the 108 pounder um Yeah, there was a restaurant you had to, you could pay what you weigh. It was like a cheap way to bring your kids. And all my friends, like one of my friend's mothers took us out and everyone was under a dollar, probably under 75 cents. I was over a dollar and I was like horrified that it was costing her that much. And it's like, it was like 105, you know, a dollar five, like it's cheap. What? But it was like really public. Every, that you get on a scale and you're weighed in front no of everyone. Way. Yeah, yeah. That was their promotion, so, but it was like not so good for the fat kid. Huh. So, so just explain that. So that's just crazy to me. <laughs> so you, so you pay as you eat. Yeah, it was kids pay what they weigh. So the adults pay, you know, whatever the menu price, but kids eat whatever the they eat is wow. like they can get something off the kids menu and the cost is whatever they weigh. And like, okay. so that place is out of business now. <laughs> yeah. But in the 80s, like that wasn't a big deal. Wow. Uh, yeah, my friend. I think my heaviest friend was like seventy-seven cents, and then I think I might have been one hundred and eight. Still, I think it was probably around the same time. So, like, here we go again, and it's just giant here. scale. Everyone can see, and I was like, oh my god, I was mortified. Oh, I can so imagine. What a way to yeah. put pressure on a youngster! Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and is that kind of when your anxiety really set in, or had it set in like when I was there already? Five? Yeah, yeah. I, and I, I mean, I still had no clue. I had no clue what was going on. But you know, you got free popcorn, like unlimited popcorn with that meal. So I ate whatever I ordered, plus probably four or five, because I was, you know, so upset and not really understanding it. Um, so yeah, comforting, right? You just mm-hmm. shove the popcorn in as much as you can. And what are your yeah. folks, what were your folks saying at that time? Were they like, you know, look, you should probably rein it in a bit or, or were they just still? My mom wasn't. Yeah, yeah. I think um, she, she was trying to be nurturing and kind and, and I think she was sad about it. And so she really, I, I literally have one memory ever of her ever even hinting at it. And it was just sort of like, you know, I'm, I'm sad that this is tough for you. And that was the extent of it. Whereas with my father, it was much more hawkish. Like I, I told him after I lost weight, um, I was 18. And uh, I had said to him, like, we were going out for dinner. And I was just, I said, I was like, listen, I have to be honest with you. I'm actually really uncomfortable eating in front of you. And he's like, why is that? I was like, because you're always staring at what I eat. And and I, re- like, I realized, like, at that point, I was thin. I'd lost weight. I was actually really like I was kind of jacked at the time I was, I was lifting weights like I was in great shape and uh so I felt I think I felt comfortable and safe to bring this up and uh you know I realized like since I was a little kid every time I ate in front of him he's eating like this like looking over at me mm. instead of looking mm. at his weight and he would you know you don't need that another role you know whatever it was like wow. he always had a comment for it and it's not that he was wrong uh, the mm-hmm. delivery wasn't great. That wasn't the way to do it. He didn't know any better. And that's, you know, that's what he was raised with. So he thought that's the appropriate thing. And he had all of his fears, you know, medically and, and just from his own experience and how that cost him. But uh, yeah, so when I told him that, he just said, well, that's your problem. Because again, mm-hmm. he, and it, I mean, actually, you know what? As much as I heard at the time, he was spot on. That is 100% my problem. Oh, but that's pretty rough. I didn't, yeah, I didn't like it. <laughs> so, but, but you know, like... I you can almost feel for the guy on some level because he, he, he had obviously been hurt being overweight himself and yeah. he so badly didn't want you to, to go through that, that the only way he knew how was to try and control you. Yeah. And uh, like, I almost kind of get that. And he doesn't know any other way than just like constantly like telling you, what are you doing? Oh, another role. Maybe that will yeah. work. Maybe if yeah. I just tell him one more time, he'll stop eating, you know? Yeah. And he was desperate. And, um, and again, like that's, that's what he knew. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't fault my father whatsoever. I certainly didn't get it at the time, but it was, my problem. it was not his. 
Totally, um, man. And of course, like, so I say he watched me all the time. I say, you know, yeah, he made those comments. I'm not making that up, but I don't know that he was actually watching me. I certainly felt that way. But, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's like that song, You're So Vain. You probably think the song is about, you're like, <laughs> who knows what he's looking at? What The world is not watching you. The yeah. world's comments are not about you. Mm. Um, you know, if I say, wow, what a nice car. It's not, that's not me secretly saying your car is a piece of junk. I'm actually like, yes. I'm talking about this one over here, not yours. <laughs> uh, yeah. But a lot of us take things that way. Totally. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's no different with my dad and, and I took it that way, but that is on me. And little did I know I was sitting on all this anxiety and all this self judgment. And so his words were really, that just hit me. Um, yeah to look back at myself and I wasn't ready for it. Yeah. Well, we, Gareth and I actually have talked about it quite a lot of late. It's just like assumption, isn't it? It's just such a bad thing to have. Like you're almost always wrong about what someone else is thinking. So yeah, don't even try, you know, like yeah. you just literally don't even know. So, and generally it's going to be a negative thought. So it's just a good reminder. So thanks yeah. for that. So in, in, in high school, you actually met a quite a great mentor and um, he was a yeah. PE teacher who helped you sort of turn things around. Is that right? Yeah, I am. Um, I actually just drove by my high school uh, Saturday and I said to my son, I was like, you know, that's where Mr. Andre works. I owe him my life. And my wife was like, really? I was like, yeah. And probably our sons as well. Um, he just, he took a really different tact about wellness and I'm incredibly close with him to this day. Uh, you know, I, I talk about him in my book, like he's, I really do owe him so much and it's not just my fitness. Uh, he set me he kicked me into a course in a really kind way that I, like, I just wouldn't be here without that. Um, that's when I started to learn more about myself and started to be willing to do that. So he, it was the first time exercise wasn't, hey, fat kid, what's wrong with you? Why are you wheezing? Why can't you go, you know, all the negative stuff. Why are you eating this? It's like, what do you enjoy doing? And it's like, well, everyone makes me run. And I hate it. My knees hurt. It's like, okay, well, we don't have to. Only he has a French accent, so he sounds a lot, <laughs> a lot cooler saying it. But he's like, you don't have to run. He's like, have you ever tried a rowing machine? Have you ever tried an, uh, you know, ellipticals that weren't invented yet, but like a Nordic skier? Or like, what? Have you ever lifted weights? And I was like, oh, I'm a boy in high school. I would love to lift weights. That sounds really <laughs> cool. Get get muscles. Um, so he just helped me kind of explore for myself, what I enjoyed. And he built it in a way that like, you'd see wins, he would set you up for how to track it. This is where I learned a lot of the fundamentals of, of physical fitness, like, create some goals, create some methodologies to track your performance, you know, start with a baseline and then then build something that's going to push you but you can achieve track yourself how you're doing it. And he was so quick to like, he'd pick up your chart and be like, Wow, man, that's incredible. Look how you did this. <laughs> he pointed, like, it doesn't matter what it was. Even if it was like you did poorly, he's like, you know, I noticed you seem to be dragging, but you still did all this. He's like, and I'm sitting here like, oh, man, I only got half of what I thought. He's like, no, look at this. You know, you had a test this morning. Like, he recognized there is a win in every interpretation. And it's not, it doesn't have to be fake. You know, people are like, oh, you failed. Why are you celebrating? It's like, well, okay, maybe you didn't get where you were going, but that doesn't mean you got nowhere. Mm -hmm. even if you move backwards did you learn something in the process did you recognize you know what your body was not ready for that or your mind wasn't ready for that and what you learned is you do need to step back and there's value in that because you're not building this life of like extremes you're trying to build something sustainable and he planted all of those seeds in a way that I actually felt like I was building the journey myself because I was and a way that let me explore putting something together I enjoyed. And that's the first time I really realized exercise, you know, everyone jokes about it being like, oh, I got to go to the gym. And like, it's a negative thing for a lot of people. Um, do you honestly expect to keep doing it then? Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, like a yeah, job doesn't have to be work in the net. Like, well, it wouldn't be called work if it was enjoyable. Well, maybe it can be. Yeah, true. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you can't, there are a gazillion things you can do in the gym or for a career. If you explore, you might find something you genuinely love doing that you want to keep doing. Yeah. Absolutely. That's how you sustain. Exactly. But yeah. And he sounds like he really empowered you. And um, it's, it's yeah. so cool. You know what, you know what, like I, I can relate so much to what you said there. Like I, I had a teacher at school. We actually, we've had him on the podcast. Um, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Fox, I have to call him Mr. Fox, otherwise he gets. Yeah, it's weird yeah. to use first name. So, yeah, right. yeah, totally. so um, but he's actually he's literally like one of my best buddies, like, and uh, to this day, and um, 
had a massive influence on my life as well. And I, I actually, I still remember the first gym session. He took me like out of school. He took me for my first weight session because he was a power lifter. He was like oh, a wow. machine, this guy. <laughs> and I still remember that first training session and he taught me so much. But um, I just wanted to find out like, what do you think like is the importance of mentorship in your life? Um, and like, hmm. how can people go and seek it? Yeah, I think... Um he's probably the first really good example of what a true mentor could be. And that's when I, I realized like, yeah, he was technically my teacher, but a teacher and a mentor are not the same thing. A coach and a mentor are not the same thing. Um, to me, a mentor is the kind of person who, yeah, they can give you a bit of an example. So you can see, you know, what are they doing? And maybe you want to aspire to that or take some inspiration from what they're doing. Maybe it's in a different aspect than what they're doing, but, a really good mentor will challenge you and will um, they'll ask you the questions that let you explore yourself. I think coaches do this a bit as well. Um, mentors add in this inspiration though, where mm. there's role modeling and, and a bit more nurturing maybe. So I, I am a coach, so it's not to put coaches down. I also mentor people as well. I think mentoring uh, feels a little bit slower, steadier, um, it's not usually a financial relationship where it's coaching. Usually you've hired the person mm. and that it just changes the dynamic. Um, it's a really beautiful thing. It's a kind thing and you can do it in any aspect. You know, mentoring is my, my sister just had a, a big birthday today. I still need to call her. Um, <laughs> and I, as I was writing in her card, I was thinking about, you know, one the different ways I look up to her. And one of them is as a parent, she and, and my brother-in-law who I think are, are amazing parents. Um, and so I spoke on that in the card and, and that sort of a mentoring type thing is, you know, just sort of probing for advice, taking a bit of inspiration. Um, I think what she doesn't do is sort of like leave me with questions to ponder. Uh, whereas is this guy, Mr. Andre definitely did. Um, I think it's incredibly valuable and it's most valuable in the places in your life where you struggle the most. And I think a lot of people don't seek them out there. It's like, well, I've been doing well at work and I want to keep moving ahead. So I'm going to seek a mentor at work. That's awesome. But uh, where are you not doing so well? Mm -hmm. That's probably mm -hmm. where it's not just that you shouldn't have one in the better performing areas of your life, but you definitely should have one in the places you're not doing as well. You know, in your, your romantic relationships, your spouse, your significant other, if you're struggling, well, first of all, maybe you two should be talking to someone together, but maybe mm -hmm. you need to turn to someone who seems to have a beautiful relationship and probe into why. And, and take some inspiration from them. And it may not be one-to-one -one where they're like, oh, do these seven things and it all works out. Mm -hmm. Well, their partner is not your partner. Um, but f asking them, you know, how did you determine those seven things? And, and getting into the structure and the thought process that led them to living in that way with them, mm -hmm. that's really valuable. And I think that's kind of where you should get to with a mentor is not necessarily exactly what they did, maybe some, mm -hmm. but more about, how do you um, sort of pull the skeleton in from that to insert back into your situation? Hmm. You yeah, that's really that? powerful. And so, so do you recommend actually physically looking for number one, some of your faults and, and maybe weak weaknesses if, or you can perceive them that way maybe. Yeah. And then number two off the back of that actively looking for someone to be your mentor then. Yeah. I, I mean the first, I, absolutely. Um, whether it's faults or um, said another way, maybe the areas of your life where you would like, where you'd like to be better. Good or, good or bad starting place is not relevant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you, if you want to take the negativity or the potential judgment out of it is, you know, whether you think you're doing well or not, would you like to be in a better place in that aspect? If the answer is yes, what a fantastic place to get a bit of help and a bit of focus to think through and see maybe you need help to probe into it. If you're not ready to do that, um, I do find that, you know, people ask me like, what do, what do folks turn to you for mentorship or for coaching on? And I struggle to answer that. It's not that I'm not paying attention. It's that I, it doesn't really matter to me. Whatever you've come for is fine. And we will absolutely address that, but we're not only addressing that. That's one thing is not relevant because we are complete people we've got many aspects of our life and like it or not they are totally intertwined totally. you cannot have a bad relationship with your parents and expect to have a perfect relationship with your spouse or your kids or your boss 
or, you know, or any one of those things and expect the others to all be fine. You mm -hmm. know, we have a bad day at work. I don't care what anyone says. When you walk in the door, a piece of you is still dealing with that. And it will yeah. absolutely be there. Now, whether you're controlling it or not, you know, that you, you might be controlling it beautifully, but a piece of you, your energy is going to controlling it and how mm -hmm. much it's spilling out into this. So it's going to affect it no matter how good you are at hiding it because some of your energy is going into that process. So these things are intertwined. You cannot have a weight issue with everything else in your life genuinely perfect. It doesn't work that way. I'm the first to admit it. So um, life is, is holistic. And nice. whatever area you think you need to work on, fantastic. Guess what? There's going to be a lot of other things that we're going <laughs> to dig into. Totally, bud. <laughs> I think it's so far. Like literally that's like Gareth and I couldn't agree more with that kind of statement. Honestly, I think it's literally one of the, the way you said it as well was really succinct. I think it's one of the most powerful people should definitely re-listen to that part because I don't think people really understand how linked everything is. Like you say, yeah. like the way you do one thing is how you do everything, you know, and it's, it's yeah. such a, such an important thing for us to grasp. So I'm just a great reminder. In every aspect of our life, even our, our like physically. So um, I, I'm at this conference. I was driving here with, uh, with a friend the other day, uh, yesterday, and he asked about my weekend. I was like, I went for this uh, longer run that I've been going, than I've been going for lately. And I said, um, I think I might have a broken toe when my toes really started to hurt as if it was broken. And so that affected my gait. And I still had like a mile and a half to get back to my car. Like I, I had to finish the run. And I was time constrained, so like I had to push through. Um, have to is an interesting word, but I felt like I had to. Uh, <laughs> and and oddly enough, I feel like my finger's broken now, and nothing mm. has happened. And I felt it as soon as the run was done. Nothing happened to my finger. It's because the skeleton and your muscular muscular system is all interconnected, and like it's just a fact. And so things start pulling and you start adjusting. And so I know it's just because like whatever happened to the tendons in my arm because of how I was shifting my weight and moving differently, it's not actually broken. It, it's a tendon injury, I can tell. But like, that's because of what happened in my foot. Mm. And like, why would my hand hurt? But it does. And it's getting better because I'm treating my foot. And so like, everything in life is interconnected. You can't get away from that. And that's not like woo woo hippie kind of stuff. That's mm. just like, it's science. Like it's just a fact. Yeah. yeah. Speaking our language, but that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Brian, look, um, it sounds like, you know, you'd, you'd have a lot of ups and downs into that point, obviously. And, um, but the root of the cause, um, was not quite resolved though. And the anxiety actually got the better of you. And the weight came back in college, didn't it? Yeah, so it started back on in college. Um, I think it just turned into, well, it was like a young adult life that lots of people go through. Like every year you put on a few pounds, no big deal. I never really looked obese again. Um, but from losing the 100 pounds when I was 17 turning 18, by the time I was uh, 33 or 32, um, I had gone from 180 to 222. So I put back on 42 of the 100 pounds and, you know, was on the trajectory to, there's a show called My 600 Pound Life. Like, I'm sure by now, if I was still alive, I'd be on it. Wow. Um, I just like, it was just getting worse and worse. And every year I was a little bit less active and a little bit more um, unhappy. And, you know, I was in physical pain. I had had back surgery and just never did the PT for it. So like, it, things just weren't happy. Um, my anxiety was really flared up. Hmm. I was just angry about lots of things. Uh, on the plus side, I was a dad. I had a two-year-old son and I have a wife who's definitely out of my league in a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> but I wasn't, I wasn't great in the house. Like I wasn't, uh, I just, I, because of the anxiety, I was constantly looking at the burden on me, all the things I had to do. And all the things I would have to do because other things weren't going right. So like anything I saw that I didn't think was going correctly, I viewed as creating more of a burden on me. And so I would react to it. And it was always sort of like, get out of my way. I have to do these things because if I don't, it's just going to get worse. Cause that's how I've been trained my whole life. I was even a management consultant, which like, that was my job. Get out of my way. You messed everything up. I'm going to jump in and fix it. And then mm. it's like, oh, here's a bonus because you fixed that well. So it was like rewarded, you know, Pavlovian dog kind of thing. Mm. Um, 
yeah, I was constantly being taught like you have bad anxiety and that's a good thing. So l- let it loose and we'll reward you for that. Uh, it doesn't play out so well at home. Mm. And there was this moment. Um, so in 2011, my wife uh, got really sick and she has a chronic illness we didn't know about. It reared its head then and it took her down pretty dramatically. Um, and uh, it got to a point by the end of June, June 30th, I got a call from her doctor. She's at this point bedridden, uh, barely 100 pounds. And uh, I was now working from home. Uh, I was working for a British company. So like the time zone kind of helped. But I still like they gave me some flexibility to work from home during the day so I could take care of her. Um, our son was just two. So, you know, he obviously was not able to take care of himself. And she was a stay at home mom. So we didn't have any alternative solution set up and this this came on really fast it was like beginning of june to the end of june you know 180 change in her situation um and i get this call from her primary care doctor who's just like i'm going on vacation for six weeks i'll check in with you when i'm back Mm. and i was like um you know she barely was 100 pounds at that point she was losing two pounds every day Mm. and i just said i was like doctor do the math she won't be here in six weeks i mean literally like there that the math does not work out. She will stop existing at some point. Um, and his response was just, okay, we'll take her to the emergency room if you need to. And he literally hung up and he's like, so like, Oh, okay, whatever. Click. Uh, so I get off that call. I walk back into our bedroom and our son is standing at the foot of the bed. He was like playing with something and also looking at his mother and he's essentially watching her die in front of his eyes. And uh, he turned and looked at me and like, as soon as his eyes hit me, that's everything hit me. Then it's like, you know, the gravity of the situation I was well aware of. And obviously like Mr. Anxiety, um, you know, I, I got that. Uh, but what hit me was my place in that whole situation and how I thought I was making it better by like, I was doing everything, you know, cooking and cleaning and um, helping her get to her appointments and, and whatever but I was not standing with her at all. Like anytime she voiced her discomfort, her fears, I was like problem solver guy. Like you can't talk Mm. like that. You have to do this instead. The doctor said, do this. Why aren't you doing it? Like it was constantly like snapping at her and try like, I couldn't hear any more negativity. I couldn't hear any more about how bad things were. And so I was just quick to like jump and try to dismiss it or be like, take these actions and because to me Mm. like you take action problems go away that's Mm. how i'd always lived um and it had served me really well but not here and that's the last thing you need when that's like i mean think about what my wife was feeling you know like she can't take care of her child who is everything to her and her life's slipping away and she's in constant pain um and then this guy who she thought loved her is like yelling at her to stop that's not very helpful. At the same time, doctors are completely unhelpful. They're just telling her like, oh, you're depressed. You're just doing this to yourself. And it's like, well, okay, yeah, she is depressed. How would you feel if this was going on? Um, She wasn't before that. And that's like, there's still something going on. And if she's just depressed, what are you doing about it? How are you helping her? Because judging her is also not helping. So she had the doctors doing that to her and I was doing it to her too, just in a slightly different way, but totally unacceptable. So if she was going to make it, not she had no chance with the husband that I was being Hmm. anything like for my son's sake you know this little boy like I had all these issues from divorce imagine what he's experiencing watching you know like mommy's there every minute every second of every day and then not and then I have this guy who's like you know daddy can you read to me he's like no I have to go cook this I have to do that it's like I don't have time for him I don't have Hmm. time to let him know things are going to be okay Uh, which is what I needed and I'm not doing that for him. And so uh, that, that's all what hit me in that moment is like the profound way I'm failing my wife and especially my son, uh, Hmm. which was like a mirror into my own childhood. That's why like, it's not that I I didn't care about my wife, but the the point around him hit me really hard because it, it made me stare myself in the face for the first time ever. Um, Mm -hmm that like that was a complete game changer for me and so, so brian just before you carry on what, what was the kind of lead up you said like start of june your wife just sort of started feeling bad and then like within a month she had just massively deteriorated what did, did yeah did you have any idea what was going on at all 
No, so she had always had these weird flare-ups for a day or two, um, pretty intense. She had one, the first time I ever saw one was on her honeymoon. Um, she had two of them then, one during and then one actually on the whole flight back, which was, we're coming from French Polynesia, French Polynesia to the east coast of the U.S., really long journey. Um, and she, we were just talking about this the other day. She's like, I didn't even think I was going to survive it. Um, so I didn't, I didn't know about any of that. And then she'd have these things, and then it'd be like two years with nothing. Um, and then she'd have one and again, it's like 24, 48 hours, totally gone. She's fine. So it was always like, Oh, you know, we were in the jungle, like maybe she caught something, you know, like it, there was always some explanation like, Oh, you have a 24 hour bug and then it's gone and there's nothing that shows up in tests. Um, so we thought that's all it was. She, she had one of these things like right at the end of May. And uh, it was like a Thursday night. I took Friday off. I, you know, called in sick to work thinking like, oh, by Saturday, she'll be okay. Maybe Sunday. Saturday, she's worse. Sunday, she's worse. Hmm. Monday, she's worse. And worse, like I, knowing how she was each of those days, it's hard to imagine there's a worse. Yet somehow, you know, the, the, the pain and the, uh, all the issues found a way to get worse. Hmm. And so I ended up taking another week off. And then it was like, okay, this is something seriously wrong is going on here. It's not stopping. So then we started getting her into doctors and no one could figure anything out. Um, we, we had access to, you know, we're, we're in Boston, which is just this like globally recognized medical hub. So, you know, the, the best of the best and nothing. Um, they can't, wow. they can't figure everything out, anything out. And actually I think being in Boston may have been part of the problem because the medical community, which I have a ton of respect for. Um, but it is so world renowned that there's a little bit of like, we know what the answers are. And if you don't fit the rubric of what we know, then it's in your head. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's hard. Cause if you boil it down, doctors are scientists, scientists are supposed to observe. And when they observe things that don't fit the mold, that could be an indication that there's something else out there. And that's like, you know, not so long ago in the history of man, um, leeches and bloodletting was, that was the treatment for like everything. <laughs> and, and now it's not like, you know, so we do evolve. Um, but that takes more open-mindedness than I think we have mm. quite often. It's like everything in science, like the earth is flat, you know, the sun revolves around us and everyone is just differently is a heretic. Um, mm. It's really no different today. So um, she, she was uh, the victim of that sort of thinking. And eventually mm. we did find people who were more open-minded and uh, discovered she has something called Lyme disease. Um, it's not commonly accepted that you can have it chronically. And I'm sure there are people listening who are going to, uh, think thing like we get nasty comments from people that's like you're crazy you're making this up and you know that's um I, i'm sorry that they feel that way uh, mm -hmm. we've come to discover a massive community of people who are suffering that test positive for lyme and test negative for all the things that the doctors insist they have and um why not just say okay maybe this is a thing and maybe we can do something about it because my wife is not dying right now so clearly the right attitude can be helpful hmm. So yeah. I just throw that out there. It's, it's, you know, it's, yeah. no, you go, no, Craig, Craig and I were actually talking about this before, like, cause he was like, Oh, you know that there's like a bit of controversy around Lyme disease and stuff. Yeah. And I mean, I had no idea, but something, I mean, but a bit like seriously weird. <laughs> okay. Um, I had, uh, and this is like nothing to do with our story, but it is related. Um, but I literally, this, literally the second before we started this podcast, I had an email come into my uh, inbox from Medium, the, the platform. Yeah. And the, the whole email was on Lyme disease and that it's mm -hmm. called tick, tick something tick or another. Like, it, yeah, no, no. But basically the, the whole thing was saying that there's like a, uh, like a real big outbreak now of ticks in the world. Yeah. And it's yep. just becoming like massive. And I was like, either there's someone listening Crazy. to what I'm doing or <laughs> this is the, like the Facebook ad engine. It follows exactly. you everywhere. It knows what you're thinking. Yeah. And I was like, how's this? I mean, it can, it can only be a coincidence. It can't be like they were listening. I don't yeah. know, but it's so <laughs> crazy. <laughs> it's a confluence. Yeah. There's, yeah, there, there's a lot of it going around. And it's not just Lyme. There's ticks carry lots of things. I mean, most blood sucking cool. creatures do. Um, yeah, and I just, I don't understand the attitude. I don't, but. but I guess Brian is also like, people don't like to be wrong or to say, I don't know, you know? And so, for, especially for doctors, I think it's a massive ego thing to say. I mean, to be able to say, I don't know what's wrong. 
is yeah. a big step for a lot of people. Let's be honest. So yeah. I think that's at, at, I think that's at the at the root of a lot of it. You know, the ego is just like can't actually say that I don't know. <laughs> it's just yeah, it's the worst you thing you as a doctor. Yeah. And um, but I'd like to know, Brian, like what would you have done differently at the time with your wife and your son? Like if you, if you could have gone back there and when you were like kind of trying to find solutions, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. If you look back, what would you have done differently in that scenario? Um, so interestingly with my wife, I've had more than enough opportunity to practice this and I continue to work on it. Um, my desire to problem solve and to stop problems in their tracks uh, from a relationship standpoint actually tends to drive most of the problems or at least their ability to thrive. When, mm -hmm when someone talks to you about how they're feeling when you jump on them to shut it down because mm -hmm. you think it's absurd or because you can't handle it or, or whatever um, or you try to tell them how to get past it or tell them why they shouldn't feel that way it's really dismissive um, whether you realize that or not when someone tells you how they're feeling if you don't just hear it it effectively makes them feel like their feelings were just invalidated and i don't care who you are the toughest of the tough people, nobody likes their feelings, their inner sentiments to be invalidated. Mm. So what I've learned, and I, I'm not 100% in practicing this, but I'm 100% in consciously trying to, and I'm better than I used to be, um, is if, I, if my wife is telling me, you know, this is really scaring me, this is really bothering me, if my response is, wow, I could understand why that would hurt, or I could see why given what you went through before, that would be really scary. Or even just, wow, I'm really sorry to hear that or what can I do to, to stand by you or something that's just a bit of compassion. And I hear you without do this, do that, or, you know, anything that moves to try to solve it. What I've learned is actually that tends to solve it. So stopping the problem solving tends to end up being the thing that actually like, hmm. okay, now I got this out and now it's not having so much ownership over me. And knowing that someone is aware of it and can help watch for if, you know, like if my wife is concerned about, so like there were a lot of symptoms flaring up initially and they're common things. So she has a lot of those symptoms still to this day. And it's very natural for, you know, when you have some of those symptoms for a piece of you to be like, is this another spiral? Am I heading mm -hmm. back in that direction? Or is this just something that's going to pass? Um, that's a really understandable feeling. And I would normally have, shut it to be like, oh, you're totally different today. You should, you don't need to feel that way. Or like, you know, now you have all these tools, so stop worrying about it. Totally. Versus like, wow, I understand why that would make you, you know, think about that time and worry about it. At least like for her, that's like, okay, someone's helping to watch out for me versus I'm in this all alone. I'm mm -hmm. scared and no one's listening to me versus like, okay, I know my husband's got his eye open in case I do look like I'm getting worse. Someone's helping to watch. That's really calming and settling and comforting which is what she needed and so just letting her know like i've got you i've got your back we're in this together actually can step down some of the anxiety that like there is a physical thing add anxiety to it and all the hormonal response that the body really like it's in your head as a saying is really offensive but the reality is when you think things in your head your body has physical manifestations of that it releases hormones chemical like it does things mm. to prepare you to deal with it and that makes you feel certain things. So when someone says it's in your head, it's actually a very real thing. And what if we can control the piece that's in your head by comforting you and supporting you and shutting off that hormonal response, and that anxiety response. So then it really is just the physical piece hmm. that either needs to run its course or we can keep an eye on or get some help for, or you know, do PT or ice it or like whatever the solutions may be. But supporting someone helps deal with the emotional side of it. And I'm no different. I need the same thing. I want to be validated too. So in that, now it's a reciprocal, loving, supportive relationship instead of, you know, her feeling like I'm not there for her. And so she's certainly not going to be there for me. She shouldn't be. I wouldn't be there for me if I treated, you know, if I treated myself that way. <laughs> it's, uh, it's so interesting what you say, because I, I read this book uh, and you probably read it, uh, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Yeah. And it was literally probably one of the, the best books I've read in terms of everything that they wrote, like in the men section, I literally read like this. I was nodding the whole way through going, yep, okay, that's me. And I'm nodding as in like, I'm making every single mistake here that you're talking about. 
And that was the biggest one. It was like men love to solve problems. And actually all you need to do when your missus says like she's had a bad day or someone's giving her grief at work, you just need to give her a hug. And that's, that's all she basically wants. But we just yeah. don't, we don't know that, you know what I mean? Cause we just kind of wired differently, but it's so yeah. important to, read books like this to listen to guys like you so that we can understand like how to actually respond to each other and how to treat each other. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so, the good so, news so, is, I'd like to know like what, so when do you, when do you guys reckon is like a good time to give advice? Is it only if someone says, will you yeah. give me advice on this or is it, do you sometimes have to kind of throw a little bit in there? Like what, what do you guys reckon? I would say like, look, most of the time you, you don't offer the advice, right? And unless they, they actually ask for it. Maybe the, the other time that you do give advice is if it's a repeat situation. So you've seen it happening like maybe three, four or five times and you, you've dealt with it the normal way that it says you should, you know, by, by being nice and not saying anything. And then, you know, you're like, okay, this is the sixth time it happened. Maybe you should think about this. I guess so that's what I would say. What about mm. you, Brian? Yeah, I, I think every recipient is different. So mm. maybe a bit of trial and error. But I found um, when I was genuinely willing to just be there, um, mm. the advice never came up. If there, like I never had the I never had the opportunity to get to that sixth time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a hundred percent on me. It's how much are you willing to ride through? Because you're you're trying to change the pattern of behaviors that you've established. So I, you know, I spent all this time reinforcing to my wife that I'm going to be reactive and unsupportive. So the first time I do it, like, yeah, that goes well, but it's not like she's, she now is just suddenly like, oh, now I think differently about him and he's super sweet totally. and he's there for me. <laughs> so yeah, you got to be in it for the long haul and it's worth it. Uh, and that's why I say it, like, yeah, like I, I'm better. I got, I got more progress to make and um, that's okay. Yeah. At least it's okay for me. I don't know how she feels. Yeah. <laughs> Craig, what do you think, bud? No, geez, I mean, I think it's a very real thing. And I mean, I, I think just hearing you guys talk about it now has just really triggered me and like that I've been doing that, you know, with my wife. Um, and, uh, and it's just a good reminder, you know, and, and I feel like the genuine part is the, is the hard part. Because I've also tried to go like, you know, ah, it's okay. Um, I hear you, you know, but in my mind, I'm like, yes, I just want to give you some advice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, so then it's, and that obviously shows that's not a genuine thing. Like I need to, I need to go another layer deeper and go like almost prepare myself. Next time I hear something, I'm going to be literally just listen and be there. I'm going to really give it a try now, like after chatting to you guys and like, and just see how it goes. Because I think it's, there's a, there's a certain body language and a, and a certain look on your face. If you, if you still kind of thinking, I want to give you advice, you know what I mean? <laughs> it shows, yeah. So. Well, so let me give you, let me give you some advice. <laughs> yeah. I didn't ask for any. <laughs> just like, I, I hear you. Mm, that must be tough. Um, so I have, a, I have another book coming out and it's, it's all about like, it's about relationship dysfunction and it's coming out for the holidays. So it's like, give that to your spouse and expect to be like, here, wait, why are you giving this to me? Um, but one of the, one of the things I really get into, it's all based on Buddhist principles and there's this idea of happiness seeking. Like we all, we all seek some form of happiness. And um, sometimes we don't understand the happiness someone else is seeking, or maybe we don't agree with their methods, but it, it's really helpful to come back to like, no, they're not doing this to hurt you. They're doing this because they're trying to get to some version of happy for themselves. You may just be in the way, or maybe their happiness conflicts with yours. Like, like we, we both want the last cookie, or we both want the last um, mayonnaise sandwich. <laughs> and look, there's only one. And like, if we cut it in half, we don't actually get what we want. We get half of that. So like, we, you know, we can't both have it. Um, so what I say is like, your happiness in that moment is probably not to give advice. Your happiness is for the problem, not to be a problem. Probably. Mm -hmm. like, it's, it's for you to explore, like, what is it you actually want out of this? And, and that was a big thing for me is like, actually, I don't care about the advice part of it. I want the problem solved. Mm -hmm. And so when I recognize that, I was so fixated on the methodology of giving advice without recognizing that was actually blocking the problem from being solved. And the problem was that she was upset or scared or not feeling well, like something was bothering her. Um, and I was so fixated on the process of advice giving. It's like, well, actually, I don't care about that. It'd be much mm. better if I didn't even have to do that. And there just wasn't a problem. So why don't I focus back on the problem? And the problem going away was most likely to be 
facilitated by me just being there. And when mm-hmm. I was aware of that, which by the way, is the same happiness she's seeking. She wants to feel like there's no problem either. So when I was like, oh, we want the exact same thing. We just have two very different ways of getting there. And what I recognize is my way of getting there ain't going to work. Mm-hmm. So recognizing it's- that and focusing on that piece of it, I didn't have to have anything on my face because it wasn't holding back my desire to problem solve because problem solving became irrelevant to me. Yeah. That's really well said. I also think there's another layer to that is uh, well, just thinking about it now when you're talking about it is like the fact of the wanting the problem to go away is actually a very selfish thing. So the, the, the advice giving is comes across in the guise of you wanting to help, but actually it's because you don't want to have to deal with your partner or whoever else it is being upset or whatever it is. And, and so maybe that's, the root cause of what I don't, you don't want to see your partner upset. So you, so on a selfish level, you kind of want the problem to go away so that you can feel better about your own self uh, on some level. Do you know what I mean? So it's yeah. a good way to look at it like that. Yeah. Um, and, and just exploring that deeper. I mean, like, yeah, that I don't want to deal with it or why don't I want to deal with it? Totally. Like you keep going, keep peeling the onion um, yeah. and trying to get to something that when you can find something that you're both aligned on, it becomes a heck of a lot easier. If you both actually want the exact same thing, then it's like, oh, wow. And, and I guarantee you actually at the root, there probably is complete alignment. You just haven't mm-hmm. gotten to it yet. Um, it's really easy to just sit back and say, well, that's great. How can I make this happen for both of us? And it's not by just going through my own process, which is rooted more in the, I don't want to deal with it and the sort of selfish interpretation that comes mm-hmm. with that. Yeah. So interesting. Like everything comes down to communication. Eh? Like, I swear yeah. communication is the most important thing in the world. Like yeah. the start of all good things and start of all bad things in many instances. Um, mm. How about yourself? Like you're a sort of very strong willed, strong minded person. How do you take feedback when you're given it say, and you're not seeking it? Yeah, it's, um, it's something I actually really, uh, I, I strongly desire. Um, I think all of us have moments where we're, maybe more vulnerable and less, uh, less able to take it. And it just depends what kind of state we're in. It depends who's giving it to us. It depends how they're giving it. Um, but I do find, I have a friend who's, who's very compassionate and hyper concerned with people being offended. And so he, he will not say anything critical to anybody, even if it's in their best interest or best interest of the group. Um, and so we talk about that a lot and it's like, you know, how do you, like that may not be serving them. And if you genuinely care about them, ultimately you may need to let them know, like, you know, this isn't a good thing, but you can do it in a way that's supportive. It's not like, and again, it gets back to this happiness seeking is like understanding their intentions, not malicious. Their intentions actually for something that when you understand, you'd be like, okay, that I may not have chosen that, but I understand why you think that's good. And I can give you credit for that. And when you come to that kind of understanding, it's a lot easier to deliver it in a good way. So when people go about it like that and they recognize like, I'm not a bad person, um, I can, I can take it pretty well. Um, where I have more trouble in taking feedback is when the person has presumed what my intentions are or told me what I'm feeling. You know, if I'm like Mm. genuinely chill about something and they're like, well, because you hate this. And I'm like, I don't hate this. Like, Oh yeah, sure. Now you say that. I'm like, it just it, like it puts me in this place. That, so one of my my remaining issues from childhood is the feeling of not being heard. And it's really funny when I look at when I have a, a nightmare, which to some people like, oh, there's like a werewolf chasing you. Like my nightmares aren't like that. One of them is I'm standing in the middle of an empty pool and there's people that like I worked with all sitting around the edge and they're like lobbing like, oh, you sucked at this or like you did this wrong. And then I'm explaining I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like this is what was going on. This is why I did this. And that's not even what happened or like I had nothing to do with that or what. And they're like talking over me and laughing and I'm like, wow. you're not even here. And like, so I feel, I feel invalidated. I feel unheard. So if that's the place that my mind goes to, I, I can have trouble hearing the feedback because I fixate on like, you're giving me feedback on something that has nothing to do with me at this point. And you won't even, you won't even have the conversation with me to at least try to understand my intention and my delivery may have been terrible. The way I went about the whole thing may have been like 
totally wrong for the situation and I want that feedback, but I at least need you to acknowledge like, that's not what I meant. Or maybe because you believed like, oh, he must mean this, then you're interpreting my actions differently than maybe someone who didn't think that might have. Because we all hear things through a lens as well, or we see them through a lens, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, I, I, I thrive on feedback. It's really important to me. I don't want just positive feedback. Um, that's actually something I'm, I'm working on is being able to take the positive feedback. I tend to blow it off in my mind. It's like, eh, you're just being nice. That doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I, yeah, it, there's a little bit of, of uh, I care about the delivery or at least the sense that like, at least you get where I'm coming from. If, if you're, if you can understand what my intention was, then the feedback's going to be a lot more useful for me um, versus like, well, okay, that's valid feedback, but that's not even what I was doing. Cause none of that, like that's, it's, it's hard to take it. If you feel like the context wasn't even relevant, mm -hmm. that's, that's on me. Like, yeah, they could deliver it differently, but they didn't. So what can I do to take it anyway, or to grow from it anyway, which is not just the feedback is they're a bad person. Like that's, it's not very helpful. Yeah, yeah. that's so true. These things, it takes so much maturity though, don't you reckon? Like, you know, from, from both sides to yeah. on so many levels as well. Yeah. And it's uh, much easier the next day <laughs> when the person's not around, but yeah. sometimes that's what it takes. And the one thing I will say is, um, I have tried to be really purposeful about recognizing that. And, you know, if I have reacted in a certain way that is not ideal or not helpful, I, I don't like to sit with bad feelings. I do want to talk about it. So I, you know, I might, and I'm working on like giving the person space because sometimes if I like, I'll try to talk in the moment about it and it's like, they're just not ready for that. And so I do need to just kind of sit in discomfort for a day or whatever it needs to be. Yeah. Um, trying to get better at that. Cause I, I do want to come back around and maybe like, listen, I really, I, I reacted really poorly yesterday. Here's why this is what I was feeling. And I, I think, um, I don't know what you actually thought my intentions were, but this is what I felt. Can we talk about that? That's so, so good, I mean, but it's like it's good tools, really good. And it's also like, you're just putting your ego aside, you know what I mean? And then that's, that's mm -hmm. such a, that's such an important thing. If you want to yeah. actually resolve things, that's for sure. Yeah. Ego doesn't serve anybody ever. I don't know, like there's justifications for it. I, I still think like maybe you could still do better without it. Humility, um, which is like, you don't, you know, people who self-deprecate, that's not the same thing as humility. There's people who are afraid of being egotistical. It's something I've written on quite a bit. People who like, people constantly put themselves down. I don't know if it's just a US thing. Um, I was just in the gym and there's a guy doing physical therapy for his wrist and he picked up these three pound weights and he's like, you know, he's doing what he's supposed to do. And he stops and looks around and like draws everyone's attention to excuse himself for like how ridiculous this is. And I just said, Hey, you know what? Most people wouldn't do the physical therapy. So good for you. He's like, well, I really want to get back out and play tennis. And so I, I I'm like, that's great. He didn't mm -hmm. need to like pause everyone to be like, I'm just lifting three pound weights. I'm sorry. I look like a sissy. Like, come on. Yeah. That's, that's a hundred percent him. You know, let's not be that way about ourselves. Yeah, for but sure. isn't the ego used in some sense in a good way, for example, with like self-confidence or, you know, in, in that sense? I think self-confidence and ego are different things to me. Um, being egotistical is like boasty. Um, self-confidence is sure, you know, like allowing for the good that you've done to be a thing for it to be factual and recognizing it and feeling good about that is that to me is, is confidence. Um, feeling like I did, I'm amazing. Like good for me, like getting, <laughs> getting boasty or getting uh, snooty about it. That's when you've now moved into egotism where you may be blind to your performance. You may be blind to the good and the bad of it. And uh, you know, you give yourself more credit than you may deserve. Maybe someone else had a hand in it. You know, the egotist is very quick to lose sight of all the contributions that got them to where they are or someone who's confident would, I, I think, would take piece of a piece of that confidence from the team that's around them. Like I feel that way because I know I'm capable and I have these incredible people. Like we, before we were recording, we we're talking about the last job I had and how I loved it. You know, I, I love the job I have now. I also love the job that I left and I miss those people. And I miss that company because I had an incredible job and I think I did a great job at it, but I had an amazing team. 
and I could not imagine doing the work I did without them around me. Mm -hmm. So it was this, you know, I felt really confident in the whole picture because there was stability all around, or at least from my perspective, there was maybe they, you know, I don't know how any of them felt or people around me, but I felt really good about the whole picture and my own achievements because I knew what I had around me. That's not mm -hmm. egotism. Sure. Yeah. Nicely said, but nicely said. So the, the great news is now that your, your wife is healthy and I think she's been healthy for, for many years. Um, she's working as a functional medicine coach. Is that right? Yeah. A health coach. Yeah. Um, you're also working as a, as a life coach and a speaker and many other things as well. But uh, what was that transition like for you going from corporate to kind of working for yourself? Yeah. Um, so it's, it was somewhat accidental. Um, so when I think when people are like, what's the blueprint? What do I do? Um, I was just sharing my transformation. I wasn't hiding it, you know, the ups and the downs. And in that process, uh, people saw what was happening. So, you know, I was posting things on Facebook. I had some very clear goals I had set for myself and I was tracking them every day. Like I, I was living the things that I was prescribing. And I was really open about it. And I just had people who, you know, were cheering me on, which is great. I mean, there's two reasons I, I was public about it. One was create a bit of social pressure. You know, you tell someone you're going to do something and it's a little bit harder not to deliver because, you know, people are watching. And the flip side is like to have cheerleaders. And I never really had that. And people laugh at me, but I never felt like I had a cheer squad. And, you know, I've been careful about who I will connect with and won't connect with on social media, at least on, on the more friend, friend based ones like uh, Facebook. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I had people cheering me on and that was amazing. And then I would get these messages from some of them like, Hey, it's been awesome seeing your journey and, and your transformation. I've really been struggling too. Could we talk? Um, and so, you know, just friends, acquaintances, former classmates, former coworkers reaching out, asking for a bit of help. And I, loved it. Like I absolutely loved those conversations. And so I just sort of fell into this coaching work and the more I did it, the more I wanted to do it. Um, but I still, you know, we, we have huge medical bills and, and health related costs. And so I, I really couldn't take the leap. Um, I was the only one earning in the household and, uh, you know, so it's like to just go cold Turkey. It was a little bit tricky. Um, but what I did realize and, and through a mentor of my own, he pushed me to see this was if I get so much out of this coaching work, uh, and I want to, I want to have more of an impact. How could I scale that? And that's, um, that's when it became clear to me, I re I need to write a book and I need to write about this methodology that I've been sharing with people and the story. And so I put that together and, and that, uh, that came out in 2017, um, March of 2017. And that sort of launched the next phase where things became a lot bigger. And that's where I've done three TEDx talks now. And, um, yeah, you know, speaking on different stages and my second book's coming and I've done, this is a podcast 143 or podcast and radio show. So I've been on lots of shows and um, it's been amazing. But all that, it started serendipitously because I was just really open about my values and my experience and it resonates and that's all I could hope for. Mm -hmm. so I think everything else falls into place when you're doing something you genuinely believe in. So that's my downside is I have way too much going on because it's stuff I love. It's really hard to say no when you're like, oh, I could, I love doing that. And I, I know I could have an impact even if it's just on one person. How do you say no to that? Yeah, it's true. Mm. So, so talking about some of the, let's, I don't know if that's, let's call it a challenge, but you know, what are, I guess saying no is, is sometimes tough. What is your yeah. process for like deciding what you say yes to and what you say no to? Um, the easiest way for me to make that judgment call is off values. So I've, you know, I get outreach to be on shows or participate in something. And um, if there's any whiff of commerciality to it, I tend to, it doesn't sit right with me. Um, so, you know, for example, if it's a show that's like, oh, and there's just this small fee you have to pay, it's like, you know, all due respect, I've listened to your show. It's great. But like, I'm not interested in paying to be on someone's show because um, you extracting a fee from the speaker is the reason why they're on the show, not because their message resonates. And it's not to put down shows and their need to make money. And like, I get it. I have a show. It costs money to put it out. You guys get that. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't charge for it. And I, I haven't been on a paid appearance uh, or where I have to pay to be in an appearance, uh, you know, 
since like April of 2017, like really early when the book came out, I was like, Oh, you know, yeah, I'll get, pay for the exposure. Um, but I, it's just not, it doesn't resonate. Mm. Um, cause I want to know if I'm doing something, I'm in good company and I want that company to be people who the sole reason why they're there is because of the impact they're trying to have. Mm. Um, so that, that's an easier thing for me to say no to. Um, I got connected with someone uh, through Claude, who's, you know, I think the world of, and um, it became really clear to me that he was just connecting to her because of who she works for. And the only reason mm -hmm. why he was talking to me was because he thought it would help him get in her good graces to talk to her boss. Yeah. And wow. so, um, you know, it was like, it was pretty evident within about five minutes, like this is not a genuine person. This is someone who's just trying to politic and favor their way up the ladder. And you know what? Best luck to him. That's not my scene. Um, so I, you know, um, I don't think he cared because I don't think he thought I could do anything for him. But that was a conversation that I was happy to have end after like seven, eight minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so that wasn't quite a no, but it was a, like, okay, this is not something to, to pursue. Um, totally. But then you have people like, you know, Michael O'Brien, who, who connected us, where a friend of mine, um, actually through, through Claude and through someone else, like both of them mentioned me to him. And so then it's like, you know, universes collide, you have to talk. And I got way too much going on. I didn't have any time to talk to him, but I knew I was like, I don't care. I will find a way because if these two people say it, there's something there. And of course, mm -hmm. like amazing conversation with him. We talked, we booked a half an hour. I think we talked for an hour and a half. I read his book, like he's coming on the show. Um, things like that, when you know there's something genuine and there's an impact to it, and that's why the guy's doing what he's doing, I'll make time all day for that. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that first yes, no is a really easy one for me is like, is that resonating at the values level? If yes, I will do everything I can to clear space for it. And if no, if it's not sitting right with me, I can't, like I have too much I could be doing with my time. I'm not going to make time for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Totally. It's so interesting because like, yeah, you know, we're the exact same as you, but, and yeah. we, we try and suss a lot of people out as well, especially we get lots of requests for people to come on the podcast and, and you like, you're thinking, hang on, <laughs> we've never heard of you. you like, yeah. wh why? You know what I mean? Like, what do you know about our podcast? All these sort of things. There's, there's so many, I don't know, people tackle things the wrong way as well. Like, I mm. think when it comes to communicating in the first instance. And um, yeah, yeah, kind of, in a way, kind of noise, annoys us a little bit because we're like really nice kind of straight guys that just want, you know, yeah. <laughs> want the good for everybody. And then you get people that are like really like pushy and, and just sort of communicate badly and they, they want to come on for a particular reason and we almost yeah. feel bad sometimes saying no because we don't like saying yeah. no but like you know what i mean it's like yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah so no I've, I've definitely i mean i've had a few where like i got i get that feeling in my stomach like oh maybe i just do it you know like i'll go on their show just because I, I like i don't i could do it and you know i'll just sleep a little bit less or whatever. and then i was like no because if I do that, I'm not putting my time into it. It's like we talked about, like you come home from a bad day at work and you think you've compartmentalized that, mm. but part of your energy is going sense. into it. Um, and so there's definitely, there's been a few shows where, you know, maybe I, like, as I researched it more, I, I heard a few, like there was one, so it was a bigger show. It's a lot of fun. I'd heard one or two episodes and I heard the buzz about it. And I was like, oh, that's great. And then I heard a couple more shows and the guy was like ripping apart a few things that actually I, like, I don't think there's any reason to be he's swearing a ton and just being really negative on it. And it was, um, it just didn't sit right with me, the negativity mm -hmm. and, and the, um, sort of like hatred towards a entire group of people. I was like, ah, that's not what my message is. And even if I agree with them, that's why, like, I won't go on political shows. Um, whether I agree with the person's politics or not has nothing to do with it. I don't have a political message. I'm not here for any of that. I'm about understanding and supporting and impact, not making money, uh, not promoting one party or the other, or, you know, one view, like, so I'm vegan. It doesn't mean I won't talk to you if you eat meat, you know, like, yeah. it's okay. My wife drives a car that is not powered on, uh, you know, like potato oil. It's like, <laughs> it's I do, I do have a, a hybrid 
and it, it generally runs on battery power. For, you know, <laughs> if, I, if my hair would grow more, maybe I'd have dreadlocks, but it's kind of <laughs> kind of falling out. But I wonder if you've ever been like, um, like mistaken for Ryan Reynolds by any chance. No, that hasn't happened. <laughs> that hasn't happened. <laughs> no, I don't, do you know who uh, Cars, uh, Carson Daly is? Uh, yeah. Yes, I think so. Yeah, he's yeah, yeah. like an MTV VJ, and now I don't know he's on Good Morning America or something like that. Okay. In my twenties, people <laughs> used to confuse us for each other, which okay. I never saw. But one, one, like I decided to go with it one night at, at a club I went to. I was like, you know, I was, it was not, I was not, I was not in my best, my best moment. But I was just like, you know, I have a lot of love for my brother, but I'm my own person. And this guy was like, oh my god, you're his brother. Well, the guy ends up getting in a fight. And no, he's no shouting to me across the room. He's like, Carson Daly's brother's got my back. I'm like, whoa. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> so I don't, I don't have that kind of, Big I'm a five. good person now. I wouldn't have that. Kind of, yeah, no, Ryan Reynolds, thank you very much. But uh, I can't I don't see know, that just, just, I don't know. Craig, can you see it at all? Or? I, I, I see yeah. a little bit. There, no. yeah, maybe, look, it's, it's, it's <laughs> Zoom quality maybe. I don't know. But uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, um, Brian, you, you've actually or anything now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Anyway, we'll just cut that out. <laughs> um, so you've written, you spoke about your book and your podcast. Um, yeah. The book is called uh, Do a Day, and now you, you're bringing a new one out as well, which is which is awesome. Um, and can you maybe tell us a little bit about some of your thoughts and 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 steps about true motivation, and achieving your goals? Yeah. So the, the backstory is, you know, I present all that and do a day like the, the obesity and everything. And it's really how I've overcome those things or more accurately, um, how I live with those being part of my background and, and how I've moved forward and, and achieved very different things than I ever could have before. Um, so I, the, the approach I take is called do a day. And that's what I, you know, that's what I coach people on and mentor people with. And it's about, it's about a, a present mindful sort of approach. So, at its core, you know, we, we tend to live with two things that take us out of the present moment. It's this pain uh, or sense of loss from yesterday and the same thing with the future, but it's about the fear um, or maybe on the positive side and the anticipation. Like I always say the night before I went to get my driver's license, I didn't sleep at all because I was so excited. You know, that's, but that, that cost me a night's sleep and that obviously would impact how well I drive or don't drive the next day. Luckily, I'm you know, an amazing driver, so it didn't matter. <laughs> um, no, but you know, it's, it's, uh, that, that's, that was what my problem was. I was constantly uh, either feeling pain from the past or, uh, or and living with this sense of everything about to go wrong. And all of my present moments were defined by that. And when you live with this anxiety and this insecurity from the past and, and the future, you tend not to make the best decisions. Uh, I certainly didn't, most people don't. And you end up giving up all of your abilities in the present moment, which, spoiler alert, ends up destroying your future possibilities as well. Because your future, like it's never yesterday, it's never tomorrow, it's always only right now. And your future is just the sum of all those right nows. So mm. why not? focus on this moment and do what you can do in this moment for the things you wish you had. Like we talked about before, wanting to have some aspect of your life that's better. What can you do right now towards that better? And even though it may be such a small piece, you know, when I had a hundred pounds to lose, like that is so daunting. The, the number of days I just couldn't even face starting because it was too much. Hmm. But I realized like you don't lose a hundred pounds right now. I'm not a completely better husband with no issues whatsoever right now. I just need to, like, when my wife is telling me what she's struggling with right now, I need to do a better job in how I respond in this moment. And the next time, we'll face the next time. And if I do better then, then that's two times and then more. And it will get to a place where this is just natural. But I'm not dealing with that at the moment. I just have to do better here. And it doesn't matter whether, you know, I didn't do well yesterday. Did I go to the gym a ton yesterday? So now I can slack off and I can eat whatever, you know, mayonnaise sandwiches just to keep the joke going <laughs> I, i'm not i'm not going to the gym too much right now so whether i can or can't like that's not relevant i still can make a better choice in this moment and that presence has been really valuable for me in adding up to these achievements that honestly like i i keep saying this but the things that i've achieved wouldn't even have gone on the list for me to cross out as absurd before like i ran a marathon a year before I signed up to do it, I literally said to a friend who was like, I want to run a marathon before I'm 40. I'm like, I never do that. I could never do that. Like I completely blew it off as just the most absurd thing. And I've run one, you know, like I, like the, the, the list goes on. I'm really afraid of heights, but I've climbed a bunch of mountains. 
um, you know, it's like, I won't stand on the chair I'm sitting on, but like you know, I went up to the cliff and I'm looking at like, these are things that, you know, I, I would never have done, but I've done them now. Cause like climbing a mountain, losing it's, it's one step at a time, which is really passive. So I think more about like, it's one action that you're taking. It's not just like grin and bear it and get through it. It's like, do something deliberate. And with the, the mountain climbing, like you go off the path a little bit, it doesn't mean you're done. Like you can still come back. You know, you, you eat something you shouldn't have eaten. Guess what? You've got the rest of your life to make the right choices. So you might as well get back to making those choices instead of being like, Oh, I ruined everything. I'll just throw it away. So it's, it's really uh, that's the execution approach, but that's kind of worthless if you don't know why you're doing it. Mm. And you know, for me, it was that moment walking in back into the bedroom after the call with that doctor where, you know, my son's eyes met mine and I was just kicked in the face with this sense of what really matters. And I decided that this feels really different and I better explore the heck out of this to understand why it feels different so I can pull that power. Because when things get really tough, you, you do need something deep to keep you going. You do need to be able to get back in touch with your reason for going through the toughness. Um, you know, life is not just, we'll just get through this and then it'll be fine. Well, yeah. Then something else will happen because that's the way the world works. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and you may not notice that bad things are happening because you're so in touch with your motivation and because you're achieving and you're feeling more capable. And every time I thought the world was going to end, why am I still standing? Because if it's always about to be, end, be the end of the world, like, shouldn't I be gone already? Yet, clearly, I'm more capable than I give myself credit for. So how do I come back to recognizing that and come back to recognizing why it's worth putting in those efforts to keep persevering and to make it through? So it is a lot of self-exploration, a lot of questions about what really matters to you. And I always say, like, whatever answer you come up with is wrong. And it's <laughs> not totally wrong. It's just too surface level. You know, and, and even for me, the, uh, the first thought I had was really purely around my son. And with more, ex more uh, self-exploration, I, I started to understand, you know, my feelings about my wife and how I felt like I was or wasn't standing by her and why that married. But I actually didn't get to the discovery about my feelings about myself and why I value myself and that it's okay to value yourself. Uh, it's more than just okay. It's necessary. Mm -hmm. And seeing why I matter and recognizing all the things that I went through as a kid that I wasn't ready to face yet. Like that actually took me putting my book out and being on a show and having the host call BS on me when I was like, you know, my true motivation is my son. He's like, you talk about your true motivation being deep within you, your son's not. And I talked about it in the context of like, as a father, you know, I feel him so deeply like in my role. And he's like, yeah, I get all that. I'm a dad too, but he's still not within you. He's external. And you say it can't be something external. So you're not pushing yourself enough. And I was like, you know what? You're a hundred percent right. Um, so the good thing about self-publishing is I could re-release my book. Oh, I was wondering. <laughs> yeah, I, I pushed myself further. And so I did a one year anniversary edition and, um, you know, I, I pushed a lot deeper on it and, um, that that's kind of, it's, you know, a, it's to, to have that humility against the egotism we were talking about before, but also to recognize like, I've written a book in this stuff and I'm still learning and growing. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that's fantastic. You know, that's not a, like, oh, I'm a failure. Um, that to me is a sign of the beauty of it because we keep going through life. We keep learning more things and there's always another layer to probe deeper into and you can learn and grow from that and you can find more motivation in it. And that is a, like, that's a good thing. So to find that extra spark. So for me, it's something deep within you, something profound. Uh, it's, you know, it could bring you to tears. Like well, if you see my, my first Ted talk, I'm, I actually choke up when I'm telling the story of, you know, the call from the doctor and I would told it like a hundred times over, like the book had been out for a year already. I'd been, you know, I would told this thing a number of times. I'd been on other stages talking about it, but it's still, I did it again at the two year mark, actually the day of the, the second year anniversary of the book, I was on stage doing the talk again. Um, and I, I like, I literally shed a tear because it's that powerful for me. You know, like I'm, to this day, I operate at that level where that is so um, deep and profound and values based. Like that is at my core, that it will move me to tears even today. And that's the kind of thing that when the going gets tough, like you tap into something like that. And I don't care what toughness you're facing, it's totally irrelevant because you push through it. And there's so many instances where I've been like, you know, I've been at the end of my energy. I've been like, my marathon went horribly. Um, 
you know, I talk about it really proudly now, but like that was an incredibly difficult moment for me. I was really sick, which I didn't know at the time. I was eyeing the medical tent. I was like, I I actually think I need to drop out. Like this is, I'm now worried that this is dangerous. Mm -hmm. Um, I was an hour behind the pace I should have been. I had to walk a bit, like I was dealing with depression of like, you know, five months of training. It's all thrown out now. And um, it's just a lot to face, but I finished. And I finished because I was like, wait, why am I doing this in the first place? And who says walking through part of it is the end? Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I am going to finish this marathon. And, you know, I'm not finishing it this second. So all I have to do is decide, can I make it from this medical tent to the next one? And if the answer is yes, then I'm going to continue on to the next one. And if I run part of it, great. And if I can't, that's okay. And, uh, you know, you, you get through it by tapping into the reasons why you're doing things. That's what pushes you through to be able to do that, do each day and make those choices in each of those moments that add up to that success. Wow. Mm-hmm. It's super profound, actually, especially that the the visualization of the love for your son. How could anything be more anything be more profound and deeper than that? And that's quite astute of that of that interview with that host to yeah. to actually to bring that up. I, I reckon that's quite it's quite a because you know to call BS on something like that must have been initially kind of tough for you to hear in a way. You like. You know, are you saying that the love for my son is, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, but it's it's actually quite profound to realize yeah. it's still external. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And another thing is, I guess your book is probably never really fully done in a way because you, yeah, you, this is you know, based yeah. off what you're saying. You know, it's so weird because I I have a you know I, I go through the whole thing and then I have two chapters at the end that are really short, but they're just sort of like my tomorrow and your tomorrow. Like to, to the last one's your tomorrow to set the reader up with like okay here we go. How are you going to go through this? Um, and in my tomorrow, it's like, here's what I'm going to do. And um, it's interesting because like my life's moved on a lot since then. Mm. Like I'm not at the job I was at when I wrote the book. And so I'm talking about like one day I'd like to do these things. Like, well, I'm doing those things. So do I go back and change the book again? But do a day is done. Um, the only reason why I would change it is if I had a profound change in the methodology. And I've had that. Um, and, you know, that's been over a year now and it's held up really solidly and I've coached, you know, tons of, of other people in this methodology and I've sold many more copies and been on other shows. And so I, I think it's in a really good place. Um, and that happened and I still work with it every day and it's, it is my life. Like that doesn't change. Um, but I'm not, I'm not obsessing about like, oh, but it says this and that's not true anymore. And what do I do? And like, now I'm doing these other sure. things and do it. I have another book coming out and that's, I, I, I want to keep pushing forward with, I would say like do a day is about dysfunction with your relationship with yourself and how to solve for that. The next one is called the 50, 75, 100 solution. And that's about dysfunctional relationships with others. So when you deal with yourself, now you're ready to be productive in how you relate to someone else. So you can now start to have these beautiful relationships around you from a place of having a beautiful relationship with yourself, which by the way, you have to have if you want to fix the others. Because if you're dysfunctioning mm-hmm. internally, it's going to be really hard for you to be in situations where you feel normally attacked and flip that around and actually see beauty in the person and see the happiness they want and value that perhaps over your own to be able to interact with them in a way that actually moves things forward so you can both get somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want to keep pushing ahead and I could always change things and do a day, but I don't need to. I think the book still holds water today and, and whether my next chapter is still relevant or not, that doesn't need to change. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yes. I think, yeah. I mean, you learn so much, don't you, as you, you know, as you talk more and you meet more people and you just kind of live and you're like, Oh, I've got more to write on different things and whatever. So you, <laughs> yeah. you've just got to park a book eventually and go, okay, cool. Yeah. You, you, you done, done me well. And now it's time for the next things. Um, There's one big achievement I haven't had that I call out in that chapter about my tomorrow, I think when, if, when <laughs> that happens, um, I want, I want to finish an Ironman. Um, I wanted to do a marathon first to, cause that's, that's endurance wise would be the hardest thing for me. Um, so now I want to have a marathon that goes more to plan. Um, and then I would take that on, but I also, I have other things with my time, like being a dad and my son's still pretty young, so I'm not ready to train, you know, as full time as, as I think mm. I would want to, to do that. Um, after I get the Ironman done 
and I, you know, I hear those words as I cry, like Brian Falchuk, you are an Iron Man, then I might revisit it. And I might just add that maybe epilogue to it to come full circle. But as long as that goal is still out there, I feel like it's okay leaving the next chapter the way it is. So mm. I'm good. Yeah. Good luck with that Iron Man, but that's a, that's a no mean feat. So that's for sure. Just an excuse to buy nice bikes. Oh, there you go. Buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so look, what, what do you think like is holding people back from doing their own day? You know, like, is, is it something specific? Is it like a mix of things? Have you kind of like, are you able to summarize? Like if it's a, you know, it's one thing. Yeah. One thing. Yeah. It's one thing. And it's, literally everybody I coach, not a single person deviates from this. It's the self-exploration and the willingness to do that. There's always something deeper that you haven't hit on. I, I have someone I'm working with right now who's amazing. He He's so in touch with himself and open to it and accepting. Like every session is like 10 sessions with, with most of my other uh, clients just because of how how much he's willing to be introspective. And he still unlocked things in our fourth session. It's so like not even right off the bat that he was like, I never thought about this. Like he bought, he, he kept talking about like closing on the house. And I was like, wait, what house? He's like, oh, I'm paying off my parents' house for them. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> and I was like, you did, like, you didn't even mention this. And, and so he was like, oh yeah, you know, I always swore after we were homeless that I would pay off. The, I'm like, wait, jeez. <laughs> Do you, and, and we've been talking about what he wants to do with his life and it's all about altruism. And I'm like, do you see how that story of when you were five years old and you guys lost your house and you couldn't do anything to help and you watched your parents pack everything up and put in your car that you lived in for however many weeks so they could get enough for an apartment? Like, do you see how that's all tied together and how that's why you just paid off their house? He's like, oh, I never thought about that. And he was struggling with understanding how to make a career out of that altruistic desire and it's because he wasn't fully in touch with where it came from and why and what aspects of it would really satisfy him and so it's like yeah even even the most enlightened like i said myself like you know a year later or whatever it was we, we all have more introspection to go through everybody that's the that's the one thing that holds us all back and how willing we are to do that mm. totally but totally it's so uh, yeah it's so important like yeah, just asking ourselves or getting someone else to ask us those difficult questions, you know, and, yeah. and just having that more self-awareness, like, just is amazing, like, so important, definitely. Yeah, we may need someone else to ask us. Maybe yeah. that's the catalyst, like, someone's just got to start that snowball rolling downhill. That's okay. Yeah, 100%. So do you, like, being a coach, do you have a coach yourself as well to help you or you kind of go through it, yes or no? Yeah, I so I kind of cheat. Um, I've had I've had one uh, absolutely amazing leadership coach, and the cheating part is that I don't pay him anymore, uh, <laughs> which is just not nice. But uh, no, he's and I and I thank him in the book. Uh, this guy Matt really he uh, he and Mr. Andre, the guy from high school, were the two key external people in unlocking my ability to really understand. And I think without them. Um, I'm not sure I would have been able to go through that moment with my wife's health that woke me up in quite the same way. Um, maybe I don't, I don't know. And I guess it's not relevant, but uh, he has always been there for me and he's helped me, you know, we check in from time to time. He's helped me work through just some of my thoughts and, and creating some guidance. And in addition to the two of them, um, I, I have some mentors around that are incredibly valuable to me, um, including my wife who, uh, I don't think she knows that I consider her a mentor, but there are so many ways where I do see her that way. I think she might be surprised by that. Um, you know, there's lots of stuff I'm really good at that she's not. And there are so many things where she's unbelievable at as a, as a human being. Um, she's an incredible parent. And if I'm not going to grow from that, what's the point of being married? So um, I'm really lucky for that. And, you know, my dad, as much as I, now I'm okay eating in front of him, but like as much as I had issues with that before, um, I've grown so much watching him either directly or sort of like mirror image. You're like, oh, okay, I see that behavior. I see the way he thinks about that. And I, I'm exploring why, and that's very enlightening for myself. Um, so like with everybody, you know, there's, there's good and there's bad that we see in everyone. And um, my father's a pretty amazing person who's been through just unreal things from birth. Uh, like he's one of nine kids uh, and he's the only one to have survived past birth. 
Hmm. What? Her, his mother. Yeah, she was he she was pregnant nine times and I think four miscarriages and four stillbirths or hmm. maybe five and three. I don't I don't I'm not totally clear. She died long before I was born, so I've never really known. And obviously my father didn't know enough oh. of the specifics. But so you can imagine like that sets up a whole like he went to medical school when he was fourteen. Um, what he's he's not american he's an immigrant so like there's so many things in his backstory that um lead him to be who he is in a really beautiful way but then also help me understand why you know why does he hold on to some of what i referred to as bitterness before like Mm -hmm. i I get a lot of these things so um he's a really powerful example and role model in, in in an incredible number of different ways yeah wow. wow what we found with uh with doing our podcast and um you know just craig and i basically talking every single day um is that like it's so important to tell your own story and also to um to ask the people that are close to you their stories too so yeah. for example we've both actually had a few of our school buddies on the podcast and these are guys that we've grown up with like since we were five years old you kind of think you know them you know and you know their story but there was so much in their stories which we didn't even realize and we we often think like you know it's so important to go and have those conversations with your buddies but then also with like your parents and stuff because you don't know so much about their lives is that something that you've ever explored yourself yeah yeah definitely um i actually really like to have my dad on the show i don't know that he would ever do that he probably wouldn't um my wife and i need to record an episode like she's such a key part of my story she needs to come on um it's kind of silly i can only record through skype right now i gotta figure out how to do the in person the one time i tried to do it there was too much of an echo so like we might be in the same, <laughs> same house skype um, <laughs> yeah that's that's not weird um, but yeah no like i want to have mr andre on and I actually know nothing really of his backstory. Uh, so, you know, part wow. of me is like, oh, but he would just talk about like his approach to things. And I'm like, but wait, what about why he is the way he is? I also don't know yeah. that he would want to share that publicly. So, I, but I want to talk to him about that. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of people out there. I have a few people in my circle who have some really profound stories. Um, they, I, and I've talked to him about it and they're not ready to share it. One who um, OD'd, died and is still here and, uh, you know, there's a whole backstory behind that and there's a whole story since that huh. and uh he's just not ready to talk about it um mm. a guy who did lose his wife you know i didn't and he did and he helps a lot of other husbands mm. uh widows widowers i guess um really beautiful he's not ready to talk about it mm. uh, yeah it's, it's someone who's in a car accident and uh anyway the list goes on yeah. but yeah i I get so much out of those conversations and I really like sharing them with others because someone out there will take some spark from it and it will help them change their life for the better. And that's, and that's kind of the thing like as well, I was just thinking when you were talking there, Brian is like mentors can come in many different forms and one of them can be almost like a silent mentor. So the fact that you are telling your story and someone else is on a regular basis I might be sitting back and you might never know that you impacted me, um, but I'm watching you and I'm listening to you. And and that's a form of mentorship too. And that's why it is so important to share those stories because you just actually never know who's listening. It's great to have an official capacity mentor where you can sit and talk and ask deep questions. But I think sometimes just the fact of someone listening and going, you know what, I need to go deeper on my life and maybe to start that journey you listen to podcasts or read books or, you know, and, and that might just be as, as much as you need to get that ball rolling in your life. And, and, and that's the cool thing, isn't it? Like, yeah. as you said earlier, the scale of what you're doing reaches more people. And if it's a good thing, you should do more of that, you know? Yeah. Now, you know, Craig, I think there's, there's something in what you guys are doing in your show, not to, to get uh, promotional or anything, but actually the, just having humans on. Right. And I was distinguished between humans and people. Like people are annoying. Humans aren't. Um, <laughs> but no, but so it is, uh, it's almost like learning by immersion. So by listening to conversations like this, even if it's just, you know, your school buddies or whatever, um, you're being immersed in people's stories and how that affects their life. And in what it's creating, it's, it's like an immersive study in empathy, in being empathetic, uh, which honestly we all need. Um, mm. So I, I think. He, this is the kind of show that I tend to listen to. Um, you know, I, I always call out the Rich Roll podcast. That's one that's been really 
fundamental for me. Um, mm. But so many of those get, you know, there's some that like, oh, that's interesting. I'm glad I listened, but it, it like, that's fine. Um, but there's people like I had Josh Lajani on my show has been on Rich's show, I think three times. Um, God, that guy blows me away. And like hearing his story or hearing some of the people who've just been through unbelievable things. And it's, it's like, for me, it, I feel changed having listened to that conversation. Hmm. Uh, I think we all could benefit from that. I love when people are like, Oh, I love podcasts. You know, like you just put them on and just hear people have a conversation and you grow from that. I think that's really cool. That yeah. is cool. <laughs> yeah, that's so bad. We, we like, I mean, we're massive podcast fans and actually we're massive rich roll fans as well. So ah, good. like we, we actually pretty much designed everything around rich roll. <laughs> it's kind of, and then we, and then we found our own voice and stuff eventually, you know, but um, I mean, I still listen to his stuff every single day. Just, yeah, yeah he's great. He's like such a good interviewer and like he just has yeah. amazing guests on and yeah, just yeah. a really good bloke. Um, so look, but we're actually running out of time now, um, and we've just got a just got a couple more questions. But we, we do have one from Michael O'Brien, actually. Um, oh well, yeah. So I asked him if he if he had a question for you. So he says, um, as a husband, dad, and professional with a side hustle, how do you manage your energy? Yikes! Uh, I'm a high energy is the wrong word for it. I'm a very driven person, um, so I'm extremely purposeful throughout my day. And I don't really like going back to do a day, it comes down to every second. So I don't really give myself the space to just be like, oh, I don't know what to do. Like I do take action really regularly. Um, I get up, I get going and I don't pause. And I find if I do pause, I'll probably fall asleep. Uh, so mm-hmm. I save the pausing until the end of the day. And that's, that's how I do it is I, I love the things that I'm doing generally. And so I, decide to look at that feeling and use that to pull me through and I end up achieving a ton and um, feeling like I've grown or feeling like I I always say like the best jobs I've had are when I feel like an idiot all the time (laughs) because that means I'm growing Uh, and then I stop at the end of the day and and I let that happen so like I'm extremely purposeful with my time and I definitely have too many pots on boil at once but there's a reason for that and I'm okay with it because I'm getting so much back from it. Hmm. And, and do you ever like, do you ever have a lull though? Like say for me, I find like, you know, sometimes in the afternoon I'll like, I, I'll know, I'll know that my uh, sort of um, focus is waning. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, I need to go for a walk. I need to go for a run or whatever yeah. the story is. Like yep. I definitely know that. Do you, do you have that yourself? Yeah. Yeah, um, I find in the on the weekends at home, um, I could pass out like every day at three o'clock if I'm like laying on the couch. I'm out. Um, I think I need to work in in a country that has siestas as part of their <laughs> culture. Like, I definitely need that. Um, yeah, and I'm finding that more and more as I age. Like I, I get extremely tired. Like my circadian rhythm just demands it kind of mid afternoon, mm-hmm. and so yeah, focus can be tough. So I may pick things very purposefully for that like two to four p.m. slot either where I know it's okay if I'm not like, they're just sort of tasks and I'll, I'll, maybe I'll take a flight at that time. And so it's like, look, if I pass out and I'm not productive, that's okay. Um, although my neck will hurt but if it's, uh, <laughs> or, or I'll go the opposite and I'll make sure it's something that I am really excited about because then I won't, I won't even notice the tiredness. I'm really good at that. If I'm engaged in something, you can't stop me. I don't care how tired I am. I'm, I'm in it. Um, so yeah, sometimes it's about like, I'm tired. I'm I'm actually going to go for a run and maybe I'll be a little bit slower, but it's beautiful out and that'll recenter me. And um, so I, I, either way, I'm very purposeful in that moment about how I end up setting it up so I can get through it. And sometimes that is just about respecting, like I need the downtime right now and that's okay. And if I fall yeah. asleep, I'm not going to judge myself for it. Yeah. I like that. It's just having the, having the plan and knowing, knowing yourself once again, like I know I have the dip, so let me plan for it one way or another. And these are the options and, you know, go with one of those, but it's not just wasted time because you're going, Oh, I, I didn't realize that I have this every day. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, I would like um, for me, a 45 power time. nap solo. Sorry. Say that yeah, again. I, no, it's by the time I'm 45, I would like, like, I got four and a half years. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to be able to structure my life so that I can take that downtime as genuine downtime if possible. I think that'd yeah. be a good thing. 
overall. It's nothing wrong important. with having that good downtime, you know, like I think it's yeah. important for our, managing our energy levels to do that, you know, yeah. so and not yep. feeling like you have to be busy the whole time, you know, and, yep. uh, but, um, so, so yeah, what, what are you actually planning? Uh, you know, you, you mentioned the book, what, what other things are you busy with and, and where can uh, people contact you, Brian? Yeah. So, um, I'm always busy with lots of things. Um, the books probably the, I'm trying to focus on one major thing. And so the book is the one thing, cause I do need to promotions, a lot of work. Um, so I'm going to focus on that and we'll see after that. Um, you can find out more about everything and including, uh, if you hop on my mailing list, uh, you'll, you'll get the updates about the book, but, uh, it's just brianfalchuk.com and hopefully you guys can put that in show notes cause no one will spell my name. Right. I should register like how people think it should be spelled. Cause it, my first and last name are both kind of weird. <laughs> it's Brian with a Y there's like four of us in the world, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I used to go to school with a Brian with a Y, so it's and oh, it's five of us, right? cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly um, enough, I have a Brian with a Y who works for me. Okay. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brian, the last question that we always like to ask our guests is, uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? I think it's just being really honest, um, good or bad. There's there's really no downside to it. I find if you're honest about what you're doing, why you're doing it, um, what's on your mind, things generally work out either because people respect that. And so you move ahead with that or you identify those who don't. And the reality is if you'd have to fake it for them to be in your circle, they probably shouldn't be, or you shouldn't be in theirs. So yeah, I think, uh, it's, it's nothing ridiculous about it. It's just be straight about things. And, you know, I think things work out pretty nicely from there. Mm. Love yeah. It. yeah yeah you certainly, sure. you certainly bring that sort of energy with you when you when you're talking as well and you can you know it's it's coming from such a genuine place so yeah, yeah it's so true. True. i gotta live yeah. with myself at the end of the day and that like that's where it ultimately comes from so if i'm faking it for any reason that doesn't really feel very good uh yeah. I, you know when i pass out at night like i gotta live with myself so i'd with everything so, i'm doing i'd rather it be things i genuinely care about so just be straight honest about that 100 yeah. percent. Yeah. Oh, for sure man so brian yeah just uh just wanted to say thank you so much from my side for coming on our show it's it's been one of just such an enlightening show for for me and i'm sure for everyone listening really like i, I can't say that enough uh, first of all my story from my personal side is like so similar to your youth and that kind of thing. I was an overweight kid and all that. So I was just constantly nodding my head at like, that's so true. And I felt the same way. And, and it's just, it's kind of a cool feeling to just feel that, you know, someone else totally has been down that road as you. And, and then to see where you are now is like, and that's kind of your whole story is like, go deep within yourself. And, and I've always thought like abundant health, abundant life comes from within, not from without. And, and just to hear the way you put it together is so inspiring. And it's really given me like a, genuinely a big spark and um, to just go and do more and be more, go that layer deeper. And just that authenticity is, is vital in our lives. And it's, and it's cool. It's cool to do, you know, like often you feel like, you, you're nervous to do these kind of things or you don't want to, or you resist it because it's hard. But yeah. um, at the end of the day, you know, the rewards are going to be there. And I'm, I'm going to definitely take obviously a, quite a few things home with me after this conversation. But one of them is most certainly like just be slower to, to react to people and giving that advice. And I, you know, I've, I've constantly reminding myself about this, but I think something twigged in me today, just talking about your son being, you know, it's still external. You have to go back deep inside. So, so thanks for that, that thought. And, um, and just thanks for your time. And we really wish you all the best going forward. So thanks from my side. Yeah, I, I thank you. And that was really beautifully said. And you guys are fantastic to talk to. I just, I appreciate the opportunity to, to get to do that. Cool. Man. Cool, Brian. And just a quick one for me. I mean, Craig just said it so well. And, uh, Firstly, you just come with such good energy, bud. And this is like, this is what makes a podcast great, you know, like, and obviously you're a host yourself, so you know, it's important to show up. And the thing that Craig touched on, which, uh, which is just shines through with you is your like authenticity, bud. And I think it's almost impossible 
not to like and not to relate to somebody that's so authentic. And this is a true testament, I think, to you as a person and to why you've done so well and why people look up to you. And um, you. just it's been really cool chatting to you, but it feels like we've had a really cool conversation, like three of us, three like kind of, you know, I wouldn't say buddies, but like three, 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 three buddies is like chatting and, and having yeah. a good time. And um, it was just uh, really beneficial as well. Like, you know, from my point of view, there was like lots of things there, which you said like that I totally relate to, especially in your story as well. And, um, but you're just a top bloke. So I just wanted I to say that. thank you so much for, for your time. And, uh, you know, it just means the world to us um, having someone like you on our podcast and giving you so much, giving us so much of your time. So um, really appreciate it, bud. And, and wish you all the best for everything. And uh, hopefully one day we can have like a green smoothie together or something. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I, I appreciate that. You guys are, I mean, to that honest point, right. Um, we are buds. You guys don't know. You're now my best friends. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> no, I, I, I've appreciated it. Thank you for, for having me on and, and thanks to Michael and, uh, and I guess Claude initially, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So all connected. Those ripples yeah. through space and time of yeah. these amazing people. How cool is that? You know? Yeah. 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 Cool. All right. Well, cool. Bud, well, so, thank you so much, man. Yeah. The uh, storyboard. I don't know if you caught that. I guess so you guys had some questions in there too. So I, yeah. I cleaned up like, I don't know how you pulled that together. You guys, <laughs> my story somehow. That was, uh, that was really impressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but we look, I mean, for us, you know, we I guess we're still kind of in our infancy in a way, you know, we've only been doing this for like two years, but we just feel like it's wild. You know, for us, this is, yeah, for us, this is a, is a long-term thing. And we, we, you know, we sort of pride ourselves in putting together a good production and therefore we want to research our guests properly yeah. and be, to be able to ask good questions, but because other, you know, you want to bring as much value as possible to uh, yourself as a guest, but then also to our listeners. And the only way you do that is if you put in those extra hours mm -hmm. of research. Oh, I, or one of the ways I've never, I've never seen anyone do that. And I was like, how did they get all this? Cause you didn't read my book, right? No, no, no. So like that, that was crazy to me that, you did not yet no i'm gonna no, read oh yeah sorry yeah um yeah no that that blew me away um, but it's amazing what I, you can find out on the internet i promise you i guess so me. yeah maybe i should be scared <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. craig the the term you can use is phd previously heavy dude so a friend uh, of mine Adam I Shively, had <laughs> you know i actually that. wanted to ask if you had older older brothers and sisters as well because my older brother like he was the source of a lot of my anxiety as a youngster around my weight was having yeah. an older brother <laughs> one of my sisters was um my brother was to a lesser extent um yeah it's interesting i don't go into it in the book but my brother was physically abusive like he used to beat the crap out of me and that shit, like that <laughs> okay yeah, there, we got a lot in common yeah um, I should, I should have anxiety over that, but for some reason I don't like, I, I don't, I don't maybe cause I'm, I'm a fairly big guy. Um, and I'm significantly bigger than he is, so he can't do <laughs> oh, that nice. anymore, oh, but uh, he does have more hair than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know, like that. That should bother me more, but it doesn't. It's funny. It's why. funny. Cause with me as well, it doesn't actually yesterday I sent my brother this clip of this older brother throws a, you know, like a Pilates ball. Yeah. He throws this and he says every older, this, the, the, the clip was like every older brother's dream, right? So this, this, this brother throws this, um, this Pilates ball at the brother, at the younger brother, right? Hits the younger brother, knocks him down, bounces off the wall, and then slams this other younger sibling in the face and knocks that one over. So I was like, that's like, woo, win, you know? And my brother sends yeah. the story back of like how he, shot me with a BB gun when I was running away and blah, blah, blah. And, and we still laugh about it. Like you say, I have no scars, even though at the time I probably did. I have no like issues yeah. about it. We laugh about how I used to be beaten all the time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, funny, times. that's why my son's an only child. <laughs> <laughs> Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air, stop at the toll, dig.